Welcome back ladies and gentlemen to another episode of Talks with Janesh. Today's video is a lot special because I had the opportunity to interview Dr. Bolu Oganyami, who is a dermatologist, a professor in the Faculty of Medicine here at Memorial University. Now, if you ever plan to come to Canada or go to any other country in the world to live independently and to gain some leadership qualities, this video is for you. If you ever plan to study abroad, if you ever plan to make your dreams come true, then this video is for you. So make sure you watch this video till the end because Dr. Bolu Ogunyami is going to answer some really key questions that you probably would be having. This interview was on behalf of the Student Leadership and Career Conference, which is organized by Memorial University. Now, normally Launch Forth uh, is a one-day conference with the goal of challenging students to consider and communicate the link between their academic programs, their on-campus experiences, and their uh, career. Because of COVID-19 restrictions, obviously, it's not the same one-day conference anymore. I am the ambassador of Memorial University, and I had the chance to ask questions on behalf of all the students and members who attended as well. Now, Dr. Bolu himself is going to answer questions that you definitely have if you are thinking of pursuing a degree in the medical field or even in any field just if you want to gain uh, leadership quality or just life itself you need to watch this episode till the end now there are questions and time frames in the description if you want to just get a specific question answered then you can see what time that question was asked and just jump straight to it you're watching talks with Janesh let's get started you're at Memorial University uh, the thing that brings a smile to my face is that he is also a MUN alumnus. Dr. Ogunyami is also an award-winning uh, writer in the areas of diversity and inclusion, medical humanities and medical education. He has published in many mainstream media outlets and peer-reviewed scientific journals and serves as a reviewer for JCMS and CMAJ. It's an honor to be interviewing you today. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks for the kind introduction. Of course. So to begin with, I would like to enter a little bit into your past. Uh, mm -hmm. How did your childhood frame who you came to be today? Childhood. So I think in childhood, values of hard work and sacrifice uh, were something that uh, my parents really instilled in me and my brother and sister from a very young age. My parents immigrated from Nigeria in the early, very early 1990s. Um, so, you know, from uh, from example, the importance of hard work, hard work, uh, sacrifice, uh, and dedication were things that not only would they uh, tell me, but they showed uh, by by their example. Um, so I thought to value education as well, uh, to respect others, and to appreciate diversity uh, among many different people. Uh, so I've worked hard uh, from childhood, you know, and I continue working hard to contribute to uh, this country, to this province, and this university that has given so much to me. Wow. Yeah. So where are you from originally? Uh, originally from Nigeria. Nigeria. Uh, yeah, Lagos, Nigeria. But uh, yeah, I've been here since I was about, you know, three or four years old. So nice. Nice. That's, that's really nice. So as a child, what did you uh, want to be when you grew up? Uh, growing up, um, I, di I didn't actually uh, want to be a doctor when I was when I was quite young. I considered doing things like politics or even journalism um, before I thought about doing medicine. I, and it's because you know I always liked working with people, interacting with people, and and helping people and learning their stories. I think politicians can have important roles in improving people's lives through policy. And journalism, I think, is a field. You know, in some ways, it's, it's uh, under threat, but they're important in bringing out the truth and really seeking the truth and sharing it with others. Uh, the, although I do think um, in medicine, I've been able to combine the th different things that I want in a career in terms of interacting with folks, interact with patients regularly. In fact, as you can see, I'm currently in my clinic. I just finished yeah. a patient maybe 15 minutes ago. Um, you know, see patients from all walks of life and learn their stories and also um, help them but besides seeing patients one-on-one, uh, -on -one, I participate in lobbying. So lobby the provincial and federal government to increase resources uh, for training physicians in rural parts of the province and of the country. Um, I'm, I've been uh, fortunate to be uh, published in research, as you mentioned in the kind introduction, and participate in leadership activity and advocacy. So besides helping the patients that I see day-to-day, -day, I can help uh, patients uh, on a broader uh, level as well yeah so so when you were a child like uh say for example when you were in your 
uh, high school, did you have any sort of a vision in which uh, stream you want to pursue? Uh, you said something about journalism. So uh, was it was that your main drive or uh, did you have it clear in your head that this is where you're going to uh, move forward? And Yeah, that's a good question. You know, it's hard. I think even uh, even if you asked kind of two years ago what I'd be doing right now, it wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't predict that I'd be fortunate to be talking about leadership and take down leadership roles. Uh, in high school, um, in high school, I wanted to be a doctor. In fact, uh, we may get into it later, but, you know, a lot of um, uh, leadership and a lot of leadership uh, positions just come up and you have to take opportunities. But at the same time, a lot of leadership is is planning ahead. Um, you know, they say, um, you know, uh, you have opportunities when the planning meets good luck, right? So. So uh, when I was in high school, I took a lot of science math courses because I knew I wanted to do, you know, kind of uh, lots of science and math in university to prepare for uh, medical school. So yeah. yeah, I think when I graduated high school, uh, we had to write our ambition in the in the high school uh, yearbook, and mine was to be a doctor, which worked out well. So um, yeah, I think yeah, by high school, it kind of changed my mind. I thought there was lots of benefits. I love science and medicine, and I knew. I could, you know, interact with lots of folks. So by then, I knew what I wanted to do. Wow, that's that's really inspirational. I also had the opportunity to look at your uh, video on TEDx. So mm -hmm. that was really interesting. Your oh, thanks. Speech. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Yeah. Yeah, that was that's really good. The the YouTube channel out there has over twenty five million subscribers. So I had a really big exposure. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what are the important points uh, in your leadership journey? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I think, yeah, I've always been one to think, you know, why not me in terms of uh, taking on leadership roles? Um, I mean, probably the very first that I can think of in uh, grade grade four, we had it was called Student Voice. So it was kind of a, a student council, and I and I ran, and I I was successful. I had my brother was my campaign manager, so that was the very first time I had a we'll say an official kind of leadership uh, uh, position. Uh, here, when I completed medical school at Memorial, I was a president of the Medical Student Society. Uh, wow. And here, I thought, uh, you know, I had a great working relationship with uh, then Dean uh, James Rourke and then Vice Dean Dr. Sharon Peters. So I learned a lot about collaboration, um, you know, representing the students, but also working with the senior, very senior administration. Uh, I did work with student leaders from all years of medicine. Um, uh, the medical school was in the media, so I managed media interviews with CBC. Uh, we managed the finances of our of our you know modest association. We actually had a surplus and actually gained many leadership skills and many memories during the role as uh, medical student society president. Uh, and importantly, I was tapped to um, kind of run the accreditation from the student point of view. So this was a three year um, commitment when I was in medical school, and we did have uh, successfully got our accreditation when I graduated. Yep. So. I was happy to be able to deliver that. I was back in 2013 when I finished. Uh, more recently, I was selected as a, as a convocation speaker for the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, um, and it was great to represent Memorial as the you know the only Memorial graduate to serve in that role. Um, and finally, uh, I was honored to be a keynote speaker. So here at Memorial, we had a, the Superpowers Conference. Uh, early this year uh, in January, it seems like January seems like so long ago, right? Pre COVID, but uh, January this year, I uh, was uh, fortunate to be the keynote, keynote speaker at the Superpowers uh, Leadership Conference here. So that was important because, besides, you know, the role as leader, it was nice to share some thoughts about leadership uh, as well. So those are some important points that come to mind. And as you can see, many of them um, reflect uh, Memorial University in one way or another. Yeah, of course. So uh, what is the most difficult decision you have had to make uh, recently and why? Hmm. That's a tough one um, in general. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. I, I think certainly um, lots of decisions personally and professionally with, with kind of COVID going on and, and, the, and the clinic. So I can think of one particular difficult uh, decision, but certainly lots of uh, decisions as we're adjusting to, you know, we want to, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, patients coming in and patient exposure, we want to be safe. So we only see patients that need to be seen in person. 
And uh, other patients, uh, we can actually do uh, virtual care via phone, email, computer, or some other apps. So I think uh, that's actually a number of little decisions. So every time you're assessing a patient, you need to assess the need to see them in person and then the need, you know, just more contacts. And you know, technically, yeah, there's nowhere that's as safe as being at home, right? So that's something that we have to weigh. Uh, you know, this time last year, that wasn't a decision that, that, that you had to weigh, really. Um, and another factor is whether you see them in hospital or see them in clinic and what's the most appropriate. So I think uh, weighing uh, patient care, patient satisfaction, the need to see them um, uh, in person uh, are lots of different decisions that myself and, and many other you know, healthcare workers are, are making now and we will be making for some time in this uh, COVID era. Yeah. Yeah. So this uh, regarding the COVID, I also had a question. Uh, it's, it's obviously impacted the way you're seeing clients, uh, you're, sorry, you're seeing patients now. Uh, so how are you coping with uh, this whole new adjustment? And this new adjustment is going to be there for a while. So how are you uh, coping for this? Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay. In, you know, in dermatology, we are, you know, seeing uh, many patients and helping out, but we're not on, you know, the true, true front line, like the uh, nurses, respiratory therapists, uh, emergency medicine doctors, uh, many of the, you know, family doctors, uh, uh, surgeons, um, uh, you know, cleaning staff, what have you. Um, so v very, you know, uh, uh, kind of fortunate uh, in terms of safety point of view from that perspective. Um, so I, I think the main thing is just everyone has to be flexible, right? So combination of you might see a few patients in person, you might do a few on the phone, you might do a few, you know, they emailed uh, a picture and this and that. There's many different apps, uh, FaceTime, et cetera. So it's just being, um, being flexible with, with care, realizing that, um, yeah, you know, everyone's kind of, well, not kind of, everyone is exactly in, in the same boat. So, um, yeah. you know, I'm kind of coping. Importantly, you know, my family uh, is in my bubble, my daughter and my wife. And now that we expand into two bubbles, my, my parents as well. So very fortunate that, you know, everyone is healthy and still interacting there. Um, yeah. But just, um, you know, a lot of things just have to take sacrifices. So normally we visit my in-laws, but not a lot of, you know, we haven't been doing any traveling. There's no travel planned. Um, social life is a lot, you know, diminished. So just really focusing on, um, you know, providing good care to patients and, um, and of course, spending time with, you know, very close family. So things are different, but I, you know, those are really, um, we still have the most important things, right? Health and family and uh, chance to contribute to society. So, so coping pretty well overall. Definitely. I'm very fortunate. I think. Yeah, de definitely. It's really nice, uh, you know, in this whole COVID-19 thing, how doctors, nurses, are coming in the front and working uh, for for the society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so who is your leadership role model? So who would you say would be your role model and why? Mm -hmm. um, I, I say my parents are my role models in leadership in, in other ways. Um, so, you know, I, I think being a good leader involves taking risk uh, as well as uh, hard work, dedication and taking and showing initiative, you know. Um, both my parents showed these in spades when they, you know, they moved from uh, the home country of Nigeria to leave to North America to seek a better life for their children and their children's children. Um, and my mom's a serial entrepreneur, uh, so certainly has taken risks and has started many successful businesses here in St. John's uh, and employed, you know, many uh, Canadians, new planners and Labradorians. And my, my father is a professor of neurology uh, at the medical school here at Memorial. So I think they've shown a, a lot of um, leadership skills. They continue, they're both working, they continue to show leadership skills. So they're my two leadership role models. Wow. So your father was also uh, in the academic field? Yes. Yeah. He's a, he's a neurologist. He's a professor of neurology here at the university. So wow. he, he teaches and sees patients and researchers and all that stuff. Wow. He taught me in med school, actually, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah that's 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 so nice yeah so how yeah so how and where do you find uh, your inspiration to do your work um hmm, that's a good question i i think i mean there's lots of sources of inspiration kind of all around us you know i think there's a lot of um we'll say everyday heroes or people just uh you know just working hard uh not you know just uh, working hard day to day, not getting a lot of praise. So I think there's a lot of people doing good work and it is really kind of refreshing to, to do that. Um, I think that, you know, I just, I just like to leave 
places, whether a school or work or a society community, better than than when I than when I came, first came. So I think that's kind of a theme that I have going forward, and it's just seeing you know people, both those that you know we talk about and have platforms such as this, and a lot of people yeah. that uh, don't get you know praise or platform or formal introduction that are still doing you know good work, right? You're going to the I think the, you know, the pandemic has shined light on things, right? You go to the grocery store, like, what would you do without those people working there? What would you do without the farms? What would you do without the transport folks, right? So you kind of really learn who is, uh, who's, who's important that we don't necessarily think of as being, you know, crucial people, I, I think, in a lot of, in a lot of times. So those are people that I think uh, motivate me to keep on, you know, just like they're keeping on working, just to keep on doing what I need to do, both, uh, both at work and at home. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we have a question from one of the one of the viewers here. As Great. an undergraduate student who wants to uh, who wants to become a physician one day, uh, I would want to ask you how do you deal with fear? Did you pass your courses so smoothly because you genuinely liked your courses and study material, and that's why you passed, or was it something else? Uh, okay, good question. So lots to unpack. It, so I did my undergrad at Western University of Western Ontario. Um, not that it really, I don't think it really matters in terms of answering the, the question. I, I think that, you know, everyone, every, every program, whether it's undergrad or med school, there's always uh, some, some difficult times, right? Challenging exams, um, you have to do as well as you think you can do, uh, you know, all the time. So I think it's just um, seeing it, any either failure or, um, um, you know, any shortcoming at really an opportunity uh for improvement in, in, in your future right so so i think uh you don't want to see failure as an end uh and have a fixed mindset but you want to see uh, failure or not doing well uh, as an opportunity for for growth uh, and that's similar with with fear you know if you're afraid of um you know not doing poorly or you did poorly or you know this opportunity is going to take too much time i think just try to see reframe some of these issues and see it as an opportunity for growth rather than um, you know, an opportunity for not kind of perfecting it or not getting it right. Uh, but I, I did a double major in um, medical sciences and sociology. So I, I'd enjoyed both. I, I thought that, uh, you know, when I get tired of writing lab reports and, you know, doing experiments in physics classes, then I would, you know, study about the sociology of uh, medicine or um, sociology of whatever it was health ad advertising lots of different types of sociology so it's a, it a good balance to to have those two so uh, i thought that uh, medicine is an art and a science so it's important that i reflected uh, both arts and science in my uh, undergraduate career yeah yeah so we have another question here that was uh, uh, thank you for answering that we have another question from one of the viewers here uh, with regards to leadership how do you get on top is it by showing people your ability to lead that is being persuasive and good communication skills or is it uh because you face rival rivalries mm -hmm. oh uh rivalries i gather i don't know what the person means in terms of like like running for a formal position then or because i think you know there's many different um ways to, to have leadership so some some you know uh, appointed roles elected roles and some aren't formal titles or roles at, at all right uh, so, I mean, many times people lead in, in unofficial capacities. Um, I think uh, in terms of, I mean, a lot of leadership is kind of uh, a couple of things. So uh, communication, I think, is, is key uh, and communicating your, you know, your vision to, um, you know, whoever is, is in charge of, of, of choosing leaders, whether it's getting appointed or, or, or sometimes it's your peers that will select. So it's just... Uh, Kind of really finding out what you want to do, what you want to change, uh, how you want to see the organization, and whether it's a one-year term, three-year term, you know, five-month term, five-year term, um, and uh, so really finding out what it is you want to do and change, uh, getting that vision, and really communicating that vision. So I think those would be those would be important things um, in in leadership. Um, I yeah, I mean it's I guess communicating. Being persuasive, you know, would also be useful, especially if you're trying to get stakeholders on on board, right? Because a lot of communication, sorry, a lot of leadership is a uh, collaboration um, yeah. and forming coalition. So it is important to be persuasive to just kind of sell your vision in in some ways and get uh, folks on board. So those are some skills that are important in leadership. 
Yeah, definitely. So this is a question I have for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Your communication skill is obviously so good. So how did you develop it? Like for me, I have done fundraising. I've done door to door fundraising for quite some time. So that's mm -hmm. how. Uh, I, I've got, you know, fluent and I've got comfortable mm -hmm. with speaking to people. So how mm -hmm. did you overcome? Uh, your, I mean, if you, it may not be that you ever had, but if you had, how did you overcome the complexity of speaking to new people or uh, just, you know, starting up a conversation? That's a great question. And I, I like how you said uh, skill of communication. I think the, the biggest uh, misconception that folks have is that, um, you know, everyone that they see that's a good speaker is naturally eloquent and, and comfortable speaking no. uh, and that and that they don't have that, tr you know, that trait or that gene uh, when really uh, it's important to see uh, speaking um, as a skill that can be acquired. Right. So it's, it's a skill that anyone can acquire when you when you work on it and, and practice. Uh, so for so personally, if we start with with written communication, I um, and um, so in my yeah, in undergrad, I started as, you know, I wanted to do medical sciences and I didn't, you know, have a lot of room for arts, writing, uh, humanities, et cetera. But as I went through my, and this is, well, I know you mentioned uh, my TEDx talk, but as I kind of went through my degree, I thought that besides, you know, learning how to deal with number, numbers and chemical reactions, it's important to uh, communicate and, and written communication was very important. So it was a skill that I, I worked on uh, very hard from, the, the last half of my undergraduate degree, uh, so much that I did a major in sociology. Uh, during medical school, I had it crafted because there's not a lot of room for, you know, writing and, and so I uh, did some extracurriculars in the medical humanities and did a lot of writing. Uh, I did a lot of uh, presentations to work on oral presentations, um, and then I started writing for uh, newspapers uh, and media when I was in my residency. So I, you know, just seeking opportunities. And again, seeing every opportunity as a chance to improve writing and communication, right? So even right now, I'm still constantly improving, um, you know, communicating, improving writing, whether it's oral or written or other types of communication. So I think the most important thing is just to see it as a skill rather than a trait, right? Yeah. A, tra a trait, you either, you know, you either have it or you don't. For example, you know, my hair is, is black and curly. So that's a trait that, you know, is it in, in my DNA and it won't change until my hair turns white when I get older uh, versus uh, communication is not, is, is the opposite, right? It's a skill that can change and it can improve uh, steadily, but you just have to go out of your way to find uh, experiences to do it um, and, and to improve and to just keep on working on your craft, right? It's just like if you play basketball, you play golf, right? You, you go, you practice, you keep on working and you're a little bit better than you were yesterday. So that's the only important thing that you get a little bit better uh, than you were yesterday, but not as good as you will be tomorrow. Yeah. Definitely. That's very well said. Also, I remember uh, Will Smith in which he says in one of his motivational uh, speeches, talent is something that you have uh, naturally by birth, but skill is something that is only developed with hours and hours of uh, beating on your craft. So, that's right. So it's, 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 really, it's really nice uh, that skill can actually be polished and be brought up in an individual, uh, whereas mm -hmm. talent is something that's just there from birth, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I think, uh, yeah, well, he's, you know, he's one of the best in terms of, I think, very, very, you know, he's a household name, popular people that talk a lot about uh, work ethic and, and skill. Um, the late Kobe Bryant also has a lot of, you know, content out there. Um, I think from, uh, so, so that's important, just, you know, people that we kind of know from a uh, kind of, you know, we're talking at a university function. So at an academic point of view, um, Carol Dweck is a um, Stanford psychologist, and she's done a lot of work in work in growth mindset, and that's a very important concept to have. Um, as well as um, uh, there's a psychologist at Penn who talks a lot about grit. Uh, so those are those are just in terms of resources. I don't know if folks are looking for resources. Those are some things to look into. So uh, Carol Dweck is just briefly a growth mindset has that uh, failure is not the end; it's a springboard for growth. Uh, that even as adults, right, we have the, you know, a, a near infinite capacity to grow and improve day to day. And, um, uh, you know, intelligence and creativity and leadership are not, as you mentioned, not traits uh, or, or natural talents, but there are skills that can be honed. Yeah, definitely. So we have another uh, question from a viewer here. Uh, right. He's asking, can social media 
boost your communication skills? Can it help improve your communication skills? What do you think? That's yeah, that's a great question. Um, I've actually thought about that uh, periodically over the last little while. Um, so I, you know, I've, for, for me, I use Twitter the, the most. Um, and they, uh, so right now they have 280 character limit. It used to be 140. It's, yeah. it's interesting because if you're, you know, if you're on social media and you're trying to c connect with, with folks uh, in, in the world, um, you, you have to be concise. You know, it, 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 you have to, with the character limit, it, you have to get, what you want out, make it clear to a general, you know, it's a worldwide general audience, uh, but concise enough. So I, I think it's actually useful that way. So similarly with, with writing, uh, when I began kind of writing in, you know, my uh, first degree, um, a little bit, a little bit uh, wordy and uh, a little bit rambling. Uh, so I really kind of, um, kind of tighten things up. Uh, and every, so every time I submit for um, a, a news, a news, um, yeah, newspaper or, or other kind of uh, publication, you know, they'll they'll make edits and revisions. So for me, uh, I always look at those. So I look at the final product that they publish and compare to what I submit. And then that shows you what, you know, what they fix. And a lot of it is just shortening things and tightening it. So I think social media can be interesting in a way in terms of tightening your communication. And yeah. another idea is just, you know, we're all we're all biased and see the world from our our point of view and our perspectives. But when you put something out there, then other people again, uh, when they see your content, their uh, impression is clouded by their perspectives and their uh, yeah. their points of view and, and their biases. So you can learn from people's reactions to what you post. Uh, it helps you kind of reflect a little bit. So those are two useful uh, kind of things you can get from social media. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. So another question is, uh, we have here, I want to ask about human anatomy. I find it really easy to see drawings of textbook images of cell structures, lung structures, etc. However, I am really afraid I might faint looking at an actual human dissection. And mm. I'm scared of cutting and uh, is looking at blood. So how do you overcome uh, this medical shock? That's it. Yeah, uh, that one's an interesting question. Um, it's true that it's not the same because, uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, or the person mentioned looking at it in real life is different. And when you, you know, when you see that this is a real, um, you know, it's a real human that lives that, uh, you know, we're grateful that they donated their body to, to science, but it's not just looking at it, you know, feeling it and actually smelling it. Right. So there's, there's you know, there's, <laughs> I can formulas used to, well, formula is used to preserve the bodies, but it's, it, it, you know, it's not for the, the, the most fainted heart. I think one of my cousins, you know, in Nigeria, she, um, there's some uh, some doctors in the family, but she was less keen to do it just because you know the first time they're in the cadaver land, they're like, no, nope, I'm out. <laughs> um, I, I do think that um, you know uh, many people, I can't say most, but certainly many people can can get used to it. You know, the the, the human body uh, uh, desensitizes. You know, that's and that's a crucial uh, adaptation, right? The human body desensitizes. It's uh, similar to just to make things a bit lighter. You may have seen the commercial i don't know if it's bounty or what they talk about being nose blind right so if you if you you know if your house is a bit smelly uh, you won't notice it when you're there but if you leave and come back in two hours you'll be like oh my god i can't believe i lived in this <laughs> last couple of days so it's similar with, with a lot of a lot of reactions i think most people uh can get um uh desensitized to a noxious stimuli so i wouldn't you know rule i wouldn't rule things out based on that but it, it is something to consider right i mean there's going to be there's gonna be, yeah. I mean, there's gonna be blood and guts and some of the, some of those. That's all part of, part of being a doctor, right? Yeah. So another another question is, uh, what keeps you motivated to build a hopeful future in this province, and uh, when you could be anywhere in the world? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Uh, I mean, the main thing is, like everyone, for me, the province is home. You know, this is really the only home that I that I remember. Um, and yeah, I mean, all my you know childhood memories uh, are are here in St. John's. I grew up in the West End, and you know, friends, family, friends are here. So for me, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't live anywhere else. Uh, in terms of uh, yeah, um, hope hope is important. I think you know, hope is important uh, all around the world these days. I, I would say particularly in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, you know, with our our fiscal situation and some other challenges that we're facing, even on top of the rest of say the country. Um, so it is important to, to keep hope, 
I think that, you know, uh, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are, are a very hardy bunch. So, you know, I have no doubt that we can, you know, this too shall pass and we shall kind of overcome some of the challenges, whether it be COVID, financial, um, et cetera. Um, so I do you know, I, I think it's important to keep a positive perspective and, and just, just leverage some of the uh, benefits that, that we have. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever think of moving out somewhere else? Uh, maybe during your, uh, after your med medical degree? Did you ever think of yeah. that? Uh, well, you know, the only time I lived outside of Newfoundland uh, was for training. So I did a four-year degree at, at, at Western uh, just because they didn't have that particular program here at Memorial. Uh, I came back here for medical school and did some graduate school. And then I did my dermatology training at UBC. Mm -hmm. uh, I always wanted to come back here, but I knew that, they, they you know, we don't have a dermatology training program here at, uh, in, in Newfoundland. So I went to Vancouver for five years and came back a couple of years ago. Um, I would, I mean, it's up to me, I would live here, you know, forever, die in, probably in St. John's. Um, you know, there are, yeah, there's, certainly there's other opportunities. Um, I think that some, you know, opportunities uh, and getting expertise are, are best abroad, um, you know, uh, but for me, the whole goal, just, just like I went to Vancouver for five years to train, was to bring that skill back, right, to help people in my home province. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, depending if, you know, I have other interests um, outside of, um, you know, medicine, things like leadership and helping out the community. So if there are uh, opportunities to uh, develop skills um, and just different perspectives that I can bring to improve the lot of, uh, you know, of, of folks here at Newfoundland Labrador, then that would be, uh, yeah, that would be an opportunity to, to go away to, to learn uh, in order to kind of bring that back here. Yeah, yeah. So this is a question I've had personally. I've always wanted to ask a medical student. Uh, I don't have many friends in the medical department, but now that I have you, I'd like to ask you. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All ears. So uh, when you were in your medical school or uh, when you were preparing for it, I'm sure there must be very little time for you uh, to do other activities like you know social gatherings or, or doing entertainment. You must have very little time for that. So how did you manage that? How did you uh, do your time management? How did you equally divide your time uh, with everything that you're supposed to do with all your responsibilities? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, and uh, yeah, it's funny looking back. So now I'm a father, I have a 10 month old at home. And, um, you know, that's, you know, being a parent is a lot, especially to young children, is a lot busier uh, than, than being a, a student uh, in, in my personal experience. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, uh, yeah, time management is is very I important. Um, I think a lot of it is just knowing the difference between things that are some things are important and not urgent, some things are urgent and not important, and just sorting that out, right? So, so typically, um, um, yeah, we would do courses and study, and you know, after an exam, you don't really feel like studying because you just kind of you know, you may have crammed for it. Uh, then I'll spend time doing some uh, some other extracurricular activities. Um, and I, in a way, I saw them as kind of a break from, you know, you know, besides studying medicine, it's important to uh, talk about things like uh, lobbying the government or um, uh, working on policy, uh, educational policy, um, and then involvement with the medical student society, et cetera. So I kind of saw it as a little bit of a break from, from studies. So th that was important. Uh, definitely lots of time management. You know, I had, you know, I had a calendar of kind of things to do things that have to be done today, things that can wait a week, things to do only if you have extra time, et cetera. So it's just kind of setting priorities, putting things in categories of urgency and, and importance and uh, yeah, and just finding the time and, uh, and you know, trying to be, uh, trying to be efficient uh, as much as we can as well. Yeah, so basically to do medicine, you have to be very much, you know, in your, very much in your time management skill, you have to be in the top of your time and uh, be, be counting every second. Well, maybe not every second, but but again, see, use the word again, skill, right? Time yeah. management skill. Uh, so you kind of um, um, you, you kind of learn as you go. Uh, yeah, you kind of lo learn as you go, kind of what, how much attention things need to do, and you know, multitasking, etc. So again, I think you know, just just as well anyone can do it. It just takes a bit of, uh, yeah, it just takes a bit of getting used to. That's nice. Yeah. So another question that we have from one of the viewers is. Uh, tell us of a book that you thought was really helpful to you. Helpful. Um, a couple of books. Um, 
I suppose in terms of being helpful, um, I read a book by Adam Grant, Originals, that was was uh, interesting. Um, it, it talks about uh, 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 leaders and being, you know, being um, original and some of the skills that they had and how opportunity played a role and some of the different ways of thinking. So I thought that was very important in terms of leadership. It has some uh, good, important case studies and it was very easy to read. So I thought that was, uh, yeah, I thought that was uh, very helpful. Um, I think in terms of being impactful, probably the most impactful book I've read is called Things Fall Apart um, by Chenua Achebe. He's, he's a Nigerian author. Uh, so he, so that one is uh, fiction. It talks about uh, colonialism uh, in Nigeria and the experience that you know uh, contact with uh, the Western world had uh, on on Nigeria and uh, and the folks there. So that was an important because um, you know I think it's important to to have a look at um, it's, it's, well I mean uh, history and the the role that uh, you know our history collective history has in shaping where we are today. Um, so that was a more impactful book, but I thought that uh, Originals by Adam Grant was, was also very, uh, yeah, uh, useful and interesting read. Yeah, yeah. I have a book here uh, that I really enjoy. I, I finished it like three times already. Uh, this book is by Dale Carnegie. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, How to Win Friends and Influence People. So uh, this is one really, really nice uh, book to actually, you know. Yeah, that. This. That one is, yeah, that one's a very, very popular book. Uh, that one must, it must have been selling millions of, millions of, of copies, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I've, I've heard of that. Yeah. yeah. That, that, I mean, that's, that's not surprising. It's, you know, it's one of those, uh, like the art of the deal, you know, it's, it's like the art of the deal. It's like a book that kind of everyone knows. I actually, I haven't personally read it. I really, I really should, but uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that one. Of course. So this uh, is another question is on leadership. Uh, do mm -hmm. you have a mentor? and how have they influenced you? Yeah, so that's actually a very great point. Um, I've had a lot of mentors, um, and it's one of those things where when you're kind of in it and, and um, you know, going through uh, training, et cetera, you don't really realize it until you reflect after. Uh, I was very fortunate, and, um, and there, so and mainly at, at Memorial, so I'll, I, in fact, I'll kind of go through it a little bit to put some context, I think, a lot of folks don't um, realize that you can have, you know, different mentors for different areas and different, you know, goal, if you will. So when I was at Memorial, um, I had my uh, clinical mentor, so I wanted to be, you know, a, a dermatologist. Uh, so, um, you know, Dr. Ian Landell is a dermatologist that I uh, that I worked with uh, in, in medical school. Um, so, and actually worked with him uh, in the same clinic as a staff physician, which is kind of nice full circle, so it was like in a clinical mentorship in dermatology. But besides that, I spent a lot of time in, in leadership. So uh, Dr. Sharon Peters was then the vice dean of faculty of medicine and uh, lots of time in, in accreditation. It was three full years. Uh, you know, she was managing it overall. I was managing the, the student aspect of, of accreditation. So there's lots of, you know, tasks and meetings and documents and reviews and this and that and teleconference, et cetera. So, um, so she was my mentorship in my mentor in leadership. I talk about my mentor in clinical medicine. I had a strong interest in medical humanities um, and doctors, uh, Jim Connor and um, Jennifer Connor, uh, who uh, were my uh, mentors in that. We did a lot of projects and they supported me a lot of projects in uh, medical humanities for, again, for three years during my, uh, during, during medical school. Um, and also had a research mentor. So I did a lot of research with um, uh, Majid Krejci, uh, who's a rheumatologist, uh, just finishing up his career, as well as Jerry Mugford, who's an epidemiologist. So it was actually nice. I had kind of a pool of, of mentors. So my interest in you know uh, clinical care, research, uh, leadership, uh, administration, and writing and medical humanities uh, were all, all kind of, uh, you know, I guess blossoming, if you will, because I had people that were willing to take their time out to men, men, uh, mentor, mentor me. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. So another question is, I think I already sort of asked this question, uh, but uh, how do you manage work life and school work together? So when you were a student, how did you balance your school work and your off-campus work together? Mm -hmm. uh, it's tough. I mean, there's no... Um, 
then there's no kind of mag- magical formula. So it's it's pretty pretty typical. I, I think I found with 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 some medical schools uh, when I went through, certainly with undergrad, things kind of ebb and flow. You know, I, I think you know in exam month or three weeks of final exams, like you're not, you know, for me, typically didn't spend a lot of time doing extracurricular activities. Those, so you know, studying exams and uh, you know preparing as much as possible. Uh, but outside of those times, then you can uh, spend time doing extracurriculars. Uh, and there's, you know, a couple of tips. I think we we kind of made it fun. So um, in my first year, I lived in residence at Western. Yeah. My second year, I was an orientation leader. Uh, and it just so happens that, you know, the group of us, you know, um, almost a dozen of us, a lot of us were really good friends. So for me, it was kind of a social thing. Um, as well as, you know, uh, we were, you know, we were leaders and had an extracurricular activity. So we kind of put them together. Um, I think that was useful. Um, and the other thing, the other thing to consider, uh, I've heard the phrase that you are the average, uh, of the five people you spend the most time with. So, uh, just surrounding yourself with, with good people, I think in general, uh, is very useful. And then as it relates to, uh, you know, balancing, we'll say school and extracurriculars, uh, a lot of the uh, extracurriculars that I did and the folks that I spent uh, time with doing those extracurriculars were also kind of some, you know, either they're pre-med students or they're either way, they were very kind of dedicated. So we had a similar schedule where we would, uh, you know, work, work very hard when it's exam time and yes. explore some other ways that we can contribute to the community um, outside of that. So things like, uh, you know, scheduling, we talked about time management, important versus urgent versus both. Uh, are some tips as well yeah yeah so as a leader how do you deal with conflict within your team in a way that respects all sides so as a medical uh, doctor you uh, so as a leader and a medical doctor you must have encountered situations where uh, you have to deal with conflict so how would you go about uh, dealing with that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so I served as the chief resident uh, in uh, dermatology at the University of British Columbia uh, during my training. So there, there was, you know, there was a, a little bit of conflict because you, I was representing the, uh, the other residents. So, you know, those trainees, and uh, while, um, you know, discussing in a room mainly full of, you know, full, um, uh, you know, uh, completed, uh, dermatologists. Um, so I think it's, you know, uh, it's important to see everyone's perspective. I think everyone has their own point of view. Um, it's, all, it's important to try to see your blind spots or your biases um, as well uh, and try to reflect those in your in your answers. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, I think compromise, you know, the principle of compromise is important, but it doesn't mean that you're always 50-50 on everything. Sometimes compromise means that, you know, you have your way now and this person has yeah. their way later. Uh, so I think it's you want to kind of broaden your just your the concept of, of compromise. Um, and so I think that's important. And then just uh, staying true to kind of, you know, key values. So, um, you know, fairness, uh, respect, justice. So those should be the, kind of the overarching values in uh, sorting things out. And, um, and you know, you can keep on re other just, I guess, little tips. So you can reassess uh, problems. And sometimes it's just taking the humility to ask, right? Sometimes, as, you know, assumptions are being made. So just asking. Uh, instead of, um, you know, just uh, just keep everything on the table uh, and fully go into things with a full uh, open mind rather than tunnel vision. Uh, so those, I think, are some things to keep in mind uh, in the conflict resolution process. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the best piece of advice uh, that someone's given to you and what advice would you give to new students uh, go entering medical medical field? Mm-hmm. Um, I think best piece of advice, so my father used to, well, he still does, but he used to always say, uh, uh, what you're doing today will affect where you are in, in 10 years from now. Uh, so for me, that really speaks to the idea of vision um, and to the idea of grit. So grit is just working uh, hard uh, for a long period of time, right? So, so grit is not studying for an exam or studying for two exams or studying uh, for exams during an entire term, right? Grit is, is working hard towards goals for the very, very long term. So for me, my path into medicine started you know, when I was in, I mean, in high school, maybe even before in, in, in some ways. Um, so that is, I think it's, it's useful. So just where you are now, um, you know, it will, it will um, uh, play a role in where you are in 10 years. 
Um, and other, so you said other invites, other pieces of advice to give to folks. I think yes. it's important to go out of your way to seek different uh, experiences and to seek folks that are, you know, unlike you in, in some way. Uh, sometimes we're more comfortable or, or we naturally um, are inclined to interact or strike up conversation with people that are similar to us because we talk about what we have in common. But really, often you have the most to benefit from someone who is dissimilar, right? Someone who's different from you. Uh, but that's not necessarily a natural or sometimes not the most comfortable thing to do. But I think that uh, many benefits can come from this. And there are, you know, many kind of historical examples and um, of, of this. So, um, you know, if you're, you know, very science inclined, you know, why not take a philosophy course, an arts course? Or for me, I started by taking one sociology course and I switched from, you know, the biochem major to uh, uh, a major in sociology. I also did do medical sciences major. But sometimes it just takes just that little, um, you know, just to just get your foot um, in the door and yeah. uh, just look for an experience or people that are that are different. And you never know, you know, what's going to be on the other side. Yeah, definitely. So another question is, uh, as a medical doctor, you must encounter many stressful situations. So how do you unwind or cope with this stress? Um, I think the main thing is really just uh, for me, just uh, going home to uh my family you know uh, when i was in medical school it was my uh it was my parents and now it's my my wife and my my daughter just you know at the end of the day kind of on mine whether it's a good day or a bad day you know that they'll always be there so that's uh yeah that's really the main thing for me sometimes running you know running some things um uh by you know by those that that care about you can be useful in terms of uh, unwinding um so it, it is important that, you know as much as we talk about uh, hard work and achievement and vision and you know dedication and working hard uh you know people need balance you can't be on all the time because we're not robots right so we have yeah. you know needs um uh, emotional needs etc so it's important from time to time to unwind and to reflect right and to re-energize yeah definitely so this is uh probably the last question from my side uh, how can your story inspire students uh, to launch forth on their own leadership journey okay um, I think that it's important um, to, yeah, again, so seeking unique perspectives is probably one of the, one, one of the most uh, important things that I kind of learned just by, by, by practice. I kind of stumbled upon, but I think uh, that now y'all know uh, <laughs> at, at this point in your you know, education and leadership journeys. So I, I really do think that um, uh, you need the first, you need the humility to realize that we're all uh, colored by by our experiences, right? And that our, our viewpoints are limited. So you need to go out every way to seek folks with, with, different, uh, with different viewpoints. This is important in success and creativity. Um, yeah. And one, one example that I, that I like to, I'll, I'll leave you with is, um, so the edge effect is a phenomenon that gets its way, that gets its name because it's at the intersection of two distinct ecosystems, like the grassland and the uh, boreal forest that the greatest number of unique organisms can, that can be found. So, when we're thinking about creative way to solve problems, then uh, it's often when um, you know you come at it from two different perspectives or two people with different lived experiences come together that we can uh, that we can solve problems. So I think that's important. So it speaks to kind of going out of your way to to seek that uh, you know the conflux of uh, experiences and and intellect, uh, having humility to realize that you know uh, you know leadership you know we can't do it on our own right. Uh, it's important to have a group and form uh, form coalitions, yeah. and um, I, I think those would be the most uh, yeah the most important points I'd like to leave with y'all. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I'm made aware that you have also a few slides you would like to share. I can. Yeah, I was. Um, um, I didn't know whether uh, whether I had time, so I can uh, I can get that get that going. Um, yeah. Just bear with me. Yeah, definitely. That'd be awesome. Um, and then I think I have to share. Um, so I, I'm on the presenter. You are. So there should be a yeah, button share down. content. Okay. Here. Okay. I got. I think I got. I think I got it. Okay. You guys can see my PowerPoint screen. Yep. Okay. Uh, enter full screen. Oh no, that's not full screen. Uh, review. Review. I think if you press F five, it should go into full screen. Yeah, slide. 
Last order. F5. Oh, oh I'm, on a, I'm on a Mac. <laughs> um, oh, so I think sl slideshow play from start. Okay. Oh, there you go, yeah. You guys got it great. Okay. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about leadership in today's world. You guys can cut me off. We're getting close to four. Um, and I've actually talked about a lot of these uh, already, which is which is neat. Growth mindset, leadership as a process, the edge effects I just mentioned, um, and the importance of ref reflection and, and feedback. So, so we spend a lot of time in the comfort zone, but uh, it's important to be in the learning zone, which is, can also be called the growth zone. You know, that's when we learn the most. So that's when we challenge ourselves to uh, experiences that are you know a little bit harder than our routine tasks um, that we do day to day. So the growth mindset was um, conceptualized by Carol Dweck, who is a Stanford-based psychologist. So we talked a lot about it. So the growth mindset focused on skills versus talent. Uh, it holds that character and creativity can be malleable. So they're not they're not static. We have an infinite you know infinitely large capacity to learn, and failure is really a springboard success for success. You know, uh, failure is not the end. So leaders are made uh, rather than, than being born. So for those that are numerically inclined, right? So if you're doing the same thing for a full year, after the year, you'll be exactly where you are. But even if you increase a little bit, right? 1.01, .01, there's a considerable difference at the end of the year. So that's just a numerical way to phrase what we've kind of been saying. Um, and I like this, uh, you know, these words from uh, composer uh, and pianist Duke Ellington, right? Favorite. Uh, Simon's repertoire is always the next one. Um, so for leadership, one size does not fit all, right? There's many uh, uh, ways that leadership uh, can can look like. Leadership is about perspective. So it's about seeing something familiar with a fresh perspective. So vuja day is kind of the opposite of deja vu, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, René Lenac was a French uh, flute player turned into a doctor. And he actually discovered the stethoscope. So on the bottom right, it's a modern stethoscope. But on the top right is the uh, first prototype of a stethoscope, which looks a whole lot like a flute. It's, it's because he took principles of sound amplification as a flutist and translated them into making the modern stethoscope. So it was only because he had the experience in music and in medicine that he was important to, um, he was able to make this symbol that's, uh, you know, it's a true symbol of medicine, right, the stethoscope. Um, Another example, so pointillism is an art form. You see the picture on the left, uh, but it, we applied it uh, uh, to make tests for color blindness. So all these individual dots can be applied in the health field for color blindness tests. And it's also uh, applied in tech, right? So the pixelation on your phone is also made of tiny little points. And this concept came from the art form. So, so you know, if you kind of think laterally, then a lot of uh, experiences and skills can be used to have creativity and success in different ways. Um, I'll skip a few slides. I know we don't have a whole lot of, um, of time left. Um, okay, so confirmation bias. So again, about humility. So confirmation bias is when you only see the subset of uh, facts out there that um, agree with what you already think. So it's important to seek all the facts out there uh, and in fact, to investigate, you know, opinions that may not be uh, exactly as you have them and avoid confirmation bias and living inside your own bubble. So in this way, bubble is a bad thing. But when it comes to uh, you know, fighting COVID, uh, bubbles is a good thing. Um, so this is just the definition of confirmation bias. That's something to avoid. So I thought this was, was interesting. Um, Liz Winstead is a co-creator of The Daily Show, right, with Trevor Noah. Um, so one way that he's kind of modernizing the way uh, to use a social media, which I think you mentioned earlier on, um, she'll post a joke just to see, see if it sticks or not. Over 25 retweets in one minute, then that means, you know, it, that meets the bar and the joke stays and it goes on to the next level and then it might be used on the Daily Show with Trevor Noah. So I thought that was uh, kind of a neat way because really it's an efficient way to get feedback as an economical way to get feedback. And, uh, and it's a functional way to get feedback, right? It reflects a diverse audience on her social media. So it's important to kind of think outside the box um, in terms of, um, you know, getting things done. So we talked a little about mentorship. So mentorship and sponsorship are things that I'll talk about um, next. So mentors can be at any level. They usually provide guidance, strategies, and feedback and uh, help you to navigate kind of the hidden curriculum or hidden agenda. They can increase your, your uh, confidence. 
sponsorship is something that's not talked about as often. So sponsors are often senior because they're in a position to publicly um, endorse you and help you uh, connect with career opportunities and to advocate for your advancement. So it's important to have mentors and sponsors as well. Um, and they can kind of, um, yeah, kind of helping you to get to where you need to go. So mentorship in, in a way, you know, it's, it's like watering the plant. Whereas a sponsor, right, sponsorship, just like, uh, you know, Will and Jada here, are someone that will really uh, endorse you publicly and help you to, you know, maybe make that connection or get that presentation uh, or give you that research opportunity, et cetera. Uh, so last few slides now in, in terms of not feeling quite ready to lead in leadership. Well, you, you know, um, you wouldn't be alone to lots of, you know, very, very you know, historical figures. Uh, had similar reservations about starting leadership. I think someone mentioned fear earlier, right? So you can read this quote by George Washington. I use every endeavor in my power to avoid it. Um, C. Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, said my psychological block was that I didn't want to start a company because I was afraid. So fear would be very common. As well, uh, Martin Luther King said it happened so quickly that I didn't have time to think. It's probable that if I did, I'd have declined. And that was uh, Martin Luther King's thought on his first boycott. Uh, and of course, as history has unfolded, we're, we're very glad that he did not decline. Uh, yeah, and leadership is not easy. So um, I was a TEDx speaker um, last year, and it was you know really just at the last minute that I uh, decided to uh, to apply, and it worked out well. Yeah, the last hour of the last minute, and uh, and it was a great experience. And this thing is the last couple of points now. So where you don't have the en enough leadership credentials or you don't fit the molds of other leaders. So uh, this was an interesting article from Harvard Business uh, Review. They talk about hiring leaders for what uh, they can do, not what they have done. And that's why uh, this picture with the cat that kind of sees himself as, as a lion. So the secret to selecting great leaders is to predict the future, not to reward the past. So. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you want to communicate your vision for that organization in terms of how your skills and, you know, your personal experience can help them to get to where they need to go. Not that you can match up to who's, uh, you know, filled those shoes before, but you can help the organization in the future, not about the past. So in summary, we talked a little about the growth mindset and the comfort zone, uh, the diversity and experience. I talked about the edge effect uh, before getting into this PowerPoint. Seeking feedback is important, so mentors, sponsors are important. Leadership is a process. And I'll leave with uh, this quote from Margaret Mead. Yeah. Great. Good. Thank well, mm -hmm. uh, any any last questions? Then? Um, there is one question that's here twice, so I might ask okay. you if that's okay. <laughs> Sure. Um, people are just wondering um, how you found your mentors, if you actively looked for them or if you kind of just stumbled upon. Them. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, sometimes uh, organizations will have um, formal mentorship programs. For me, I, because I, um, I mean, did I, let's see. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was seren, uh, serendipitous. Uh, yeah, a lot of it happened to be serendipitous. So, for example, well, in, in uh, dermatology, that one, I was interested in that field. Um, so I did uh, just, yeah, just uh, kind of reach out to him one day. Um, yeah, and uh, kind of a cold call, if you will, right, if we can say, and that, and that worked out well. And that's, and, and part of it, sorry, just to, uh, just to segue, is that, it's important to pay it forward, right? So we have to lift as we climb. So we have to help help others out just uh, as we kind of progress in our journey. So just as I mentored, sorry, just as he mentored me, when I was kind of going through the racks, I mentor others because I know there's gonna be others that are going to want to uh, be, you know, in the shoes uh, that I'm in right now. So it's important to, uh, to uh, lift as we climb. Um, yeah, so some of it was, yeah, I would say cold calling uh, and a lot of it was serendipitous, I think, so if you think about it, I think we all have lots of opportunities that we don't really, you know, see as opportunities. Sometimes we'll just write it off. So I just really carefully consider all the opportunities that come your way and kind of go, um, yeah, and just kind of go from there. That's important. Take a little bit, take a little leap of faith. So not just in organizations, but also in seeking mentors. Just send the email, you know, try to flag them down, et cetera, because you never know. It's not, not, not everyone has the time or the energy to do it. 
but some folks might, and I think it's worth yeah, it's worth just reaching out. You know, a lot of people are happy to help others and are actually even flattered, right, that you uh, that they think uh, they have something to to offer you. So I'd keep that in mind. Nice. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Um, it is one minute too, so and uh, I know that you are a very busy person. So we'll let um, we'll end it here. We really appreciate you coming to talk to us today. Mm. We had so many fantastic points, and I'm sure everybody else here really found it helpful hearing your story and and what you had to say. So we do really appreciate you coming to speak with us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. It was nice. Yeah, it was nice to speak to to folks.